thank you. It's an honor to do it. Appreciate your writing. Uh, well, I'd like to introduce you to my co-author, uh, uh, Colonel David Giamona. Uh, Colonel, glad to have you with us as well. Oh, uh, absolutely. Um, love being here and just thrilled to that we can speak on this really uh, great topic. Troy, you want to tell him a little bit about the topic and he wants us to take the lead. So go right ahead, Troy, and lead off. Yeah. So in our new book, The Military Guide to Disarming Deception, Battlefield Tactics to Expose the Enemy's Lies and Triumph and Truth, Colonel Giamone and I explore the pervasive deception enveloping the world today and what people could do to avoid the pitfalls of deception as you approach the return to Jesus Christ. How pervasive is the deception today, and, and what are some examples? Well, I think there are all kinds of uh, deception out there, and frankly, on all different sides. Uh, you know, uh, Satan is a nonpartisan uh, liar. <laughs> Jesus called him in John 8, 44, the liar and the father of all lies. Uh, there is no truth in him, Jesus said, and mm -hmm. I just think we've got to make sure, regardless of what we're talking about, that we are speaking truth. I think the left would tell us that uh, this life is all that there is and uh, that we are totally responsible for our well-being. That is a lie. Uh, I think uh, there is a lie about uh, environmentalism that would say creation is all that there is and forgetting the creator. But on the other side of the spectrum, I think there are some conservatives that are under delusion. I mean, God did give us uh, this earth. He told Adam, I'm going to make a perfect garden, but you're to cultivate it and keep it. Uh, we have a stewardship responsibility without going fanatical. And and uh, I think there are some lies even about the coronavirus that are going on. And I'm sure your listeners are split right down the middle like many Christians are about it. But I think whatever we speak on, we need to make sure that we're speaking truth. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with 100%. So, you know, there are a lot of scriptures throughout the Bible that speak of deception. We're writing about these. Um, we're actually on chapter seven, so we're right in the midpoint of the book. But um, in your perspective of biblical references to deception, uh, and you've mentioned a few already, were there any that you would like to speak on that uh, would give our readers and our listeners uh, a biblical perspective of why we're having such prevalent deception right now in the end times? Well, when people close their mind to the truth, they're open to any lie and any deception of Satan. And I think the Bible teaches that as we approach the end times, that there's going to be more deception. You know, interestingly, even when Paul was writing to the Thessalonians, he indicated that because people had rejected the truth, God had sent a deluding influence, will send a deluding influence so that people are not able to believe the truth. The inability to believe truth is both a judgment of God and uh, it's a reason for experiencing God's judgment. Uh, God judges us. In other words, one of his judgments against unbelieving humanity is to make it where they cannot believe the truth, which is an interesting thought. But I do believe that we're going to see these lies increase uh, for, uh, and people who have rejected the absolute truth of God's word are going to be the prime targets and uh, uh, victims of this error that's going to be pervasive through what I believe is going to be a very real one world dictator known as the Antichrist. I have just finished preaching through the book of Revelation. I believe there is an antichrist who will rule over the earth during the final seven years of earth's history, and he will be known for speaking blasphemies and lies. They won't appear that way. Uh, he'll be a very charismatic figure who will uh, entrance people and attract people with his charisma, but behind his smile are devious lies that will lead people astray. Troy, if I could, let me follow on with that question. Uh, recent, just recently, the last few weeks, and, and I know over the last several thousand years, we've had a lot of people point to who this is the Antichrist and that's the Antichrist. You can name it President Obama, President, the Pope, and everything else. But uh, just recently, um, and these are all prefigures, Adolf Hitler, prefigure of the Antichrist, but recently the President of France has been fingered. 
<laughs> as as you know, uh, because of all the things he is saying and and doing in France, and um, even to riding a white horse, and you know all this crazy kind of stuff. What do you think about that uh, particular person, and you know, a person named just in general? Well, people who try to name the Antichrist give Bible prophecy a bad name. <laughs> <laughs> And I think a lot of people just reject the whole idea of the second coming and Bible prophecy because people uh, pervert it and use it uh, for their own purposes, maybe to try to settle a political score with somebody or something like that. Uh, I mean, uh, the only thing more futile than trying to name the Antichrist is to try to predict the date of Christ's return, which Jesus told us not to do. But I do think a lot of the people you mentioned have characteristics of the Antichrist, and uh, that doesn't mean they're the Antichrist. I remember years ago on Bill O'Reilly's program, I got in trouble for saying that uh, uh, President Obama is a type of the Antichrist. I don't think you were far off, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but I meant it in this way. I meant right. in Daniel chapter 7, it says that the Antichrist will change human law and what is understood to be natural law. And of course, it was under Obama and through his urging that you had the definition of marriage uh, uh, redefined by the Supreme Court of the United States. And I said at the time, I can be certain, Bill, that Obama is not the Antichrist. He said, how do you know that? I said, the Antichrist is going to have higher poll numbers. And it's true. The true Antichrist is going to have worldwide acclamation, at least at the beginning. Go ahead, Troy. Dr. Jeffers, what do you believe the great deception or the powerful delusion that 2 Thessalonians 2.11 refers to? What, what, what might this be? What are some of the uh, uh, ideas about this? I think the Second Thessalonians passage, the great delusion is the Antichrist himself. I think he is the ultimate delusion. But I think the theological delusion that you're going to see manif manifest in the Antichrist is one that's very pervasive in the world right now, and I've written about extensively, and it's uh, the idea, it's called the way of Cain in the Bible. The Bible tells us to avoid the way of Cain. What in the world is the way of Cain? Well, remember the two brothers, Cain and Abel, God invited both of them to come to him on his terms, but Cain decided he had a better way to approach God, that he would approach God on his own terms with his own sacrifice. And since that time, man has tried to approach God in his own way. Listen, Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And one of the great distresses to me as a pastor is that nearly 70 Nearly 60% of evangelical Christians, almost 60%, believe there's more than one way to God other than faith in Jesus Christ. That's a delusion that we're experiencing right now that will only increase during the times of the Antichrist. Also in 2 Thessalonians, Paul talks about before the, revel before the coming of the Lord would be the revealing of the Antichrist and the great apostasy. Yeah. Are you seeing that? Are we seeing that right now? Yeah, I don't know how long of a runtime it will have <laughs> those final seven times, but there's no doubt there's a great apostasy falling, uh, falling away of Christians or professing Christians anyway. You know, an interesting thing I've seen happen just over the last 10 years, and this is one example of that. When we look at gay marriage, um, it used to be, when you would talk to Christians who embraced a redefinition of marriage and you would point out Bible verses to them that talk specifically about that issue, they would try to offer another interpretation of those passages. Hmm. But now you offer a biblical uh, definition of marriage and say, this is what the Bible says. They don't try to refute the Bible or use the Bible. They say the Bible's wrong. The Bible is absolutely wrong on this. That, to me, is a huge uh, digression, uh, going from trying to agree that the Bible is the Word of God, but I have a different interpretation, to saying I don't care what the Bible says. That's a hardness of heart that's taking place among God's own people, I believe. Yeah, I've had a recent conversation with a megachurch pastor in San Antonio. You probably know who he is. And um, I asked him, I said, hey, brother, 
uh, we had a two hour lunch together and I said, look, uh, your church got 20,000 people going to it and you're preaching, you know, really strongly on the end times and upon the return of Christ and all that. How many of your people are actually going to go, you know, in the rapture or are, are ready to, how many people are really ready to meet the Lord? And his answer was astoundingly, he said, very few. Yeah. I'm just wondering, are you saying that in your, uh, and this is no way a reflection of First Baptist, right? But are you saying that kind of thing? even with your own ranks in the, in the Baptist. Uh, I think it's true. You know, I think Billy Graham, who, by the way, used to be a member of our church uh, for 54 years, he used to say he estimated, uh, you know, and even in evangelical churches, only about 50% were truly born again. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised if that's true, uh, that that's not true. I mean, the fact is, uh, you know, um, Jesus predicted that the road to heaven is a very narrow one. And uh, few will enter into the narrow gate by which we must be saved. And instead, he predicted many on the judgment will say, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did that. And he will say, depart from me, I never knew you. Mm -hmm. I think there's going to be a great, horrific surprise awaiting many people who think they're saved, who in fact aren't saved. Mm -hmm. Dr. Jeffers, well, we're seeing the explosion of knowledge today that the prophet Daniel predicted in Daniel 12.4 that would characterize the end times, including a, a plethora of new technologies, artificial intelligence, electronic banking, microchip implants, uh, nanotechnology, the surveillance state. For the first time in history, the technologies now exist to implement the mark of the beast system, in which people can't buy or sell. Many prophecy experts are concerned the world is now primed for the introduction of the mark of the beast. What, what are your thoughts? How close could we be? And what are some possible candidates for the mark? Well, I don't know how that's going to manifest itself, but I agree, and I've written about that the technology is certainly there. I think we need to be uh, of sound mind when we look at that truth. Some Christians say, well, therefore, I will reject anything that could be abused by the Antichrist or that will lead to what we're talking about. I think that's foolish. I was talking uh, just yesterday to the Associated Press. They were asking me about Facebook and Facebook's uh, desire to have uh, groups of uh, of uh, believing people in a community group praying, and they're going to make that more possible for people to get together to pray and ask what I thought about that. Well, technology can be abused. Facebook can abuse that, but it can also be used for good. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think technology is uh, uh, moral or immoral. It's neutral. It's how it's used that matters. I think God in, gave the invention of radio and television and the internet to spread the gospel. I think it's the way the gospel is going to be spread to every person before the Lord returns. So I think we've got to be careful in saying because a technology can be used and will be used for adverse purposes doesn't mean we ought to shun the technology. Uh, Pastor, Troy and I are traveling the country and really the world and giving battle-ready conferences many, to many churches and conferences. And uh, what we're seeing is uh, what, what a recent LifeWay poll said, nine in 10 pastors now see signs of the end times in current events, but they're also afraid of telling their people about the end times and about getting them ready. Yeah. And there's a great deal of fear. Why is that, Pastor? And what can we do about it? I think pastors who refuse to talk about the end times and prepare their people for the end times, they are guilty of spiritual malpractice. Mm -hmm. And uh, look, the book of Revelation is the only book of the entire Bible that has a special blessing associated with those who not only read it and hear it, but those who apply it. Uh, you know, I want to tell you a story that may seem off track, but it's exactly what you're telling, uh, talking about. Because people do wonder, well, what relationship do the end times have with me today? I'm not nearly as concerned about the beast in Revelation as the beast I have to go to work for every day, <laughs> Monday through Friday, you know, and yeah. so forth and so forth. And uh, what if the end times don't come for uh, decades or centuries? And it may be centuries away. I don't know. Wow. Uh, an interesting story. Years ago, when I just first started serving at Fox News as a contributor, a friend of mine there was 
the late Alan Combs, the resident liberal of Fox oh, yeah. News. Many people yeah. remembering. Oh, yeah. He was of the Jewish uh, faith. and uh, But every time he would have me on, he would give me a chance to share the gospel. And he had some honest questions. I'll never forget on one of his shows, he said, now, Pastor, do you believe you're going to live to see the return of Jesus Christ? Mm. And I said, Alan, honestly, I don't know, but it really doesn't make any difference. He said, what do you mean it doesn't make any difference? I said, well, I'm 55 years old, and in the next 30 years or so, either he's coming or I'm going, <laughs> but the end is near for me and it's near for you as well. And I think that's what you men are saying, to be equipped for the end times. We need to be either equipped for the end of the ages or the end of our life. Either one way or the other, we're going to stand before God and give an account of our lives, and we better be prepared. And that's why I appreciate what you men are doing. Uh, Pastor, what, what are some ways that people can get prepared? Well, we're all getting ready to change locations. We're getting ready to enter into eternity, either an eternity of heaven or an eternity of hell. And the only people who make it into heaven first of all, are those who have the right passport. You know, to be allowed into a foreign country, you have to have a right passport. And the only passport that is accepted into heaven is not one stamped Jew, Muslim, Hindu, Baptist, or Christian. It's only one that is stamped forgiven. Only forgiven people entered heaven. And there's only way, one way to be forgiven, and that's through the blood of Jesus Christ. So that's the most important thing we can do is to make sure we've got a proper passport. But that's not all of it. I mean, there are other things we get ready for heaven with. Uh, our good works, while they are meaningless to obtain that passport, after we're saved, good works matter a great deal to God. 2 Corinthians 5, 9 and 10 says we're all, as Christians, going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ, that we may be rewarded for what we've done in the body, whether it's good or worthless. Again, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says we're not saved by good works, but Ephesians 2, 10, we are saved for good works. And so I think there are a lot of things we can do to make sure we're ready for this journey we're all going to take one day. Mm, fantastic answer. My wife and I were in Israel for a month in Jerusalem studying for this next book on disarming deception. And yeah. then we got COVID and we got stuck there for a while. <laughs> and, um, and we were just amazed at all the things that were going on in Jerusalem at the time. So the question is, um, from your perspective, what is the next big biblical prophecy you think that sh would be fulfilled uh, next? We know Israel became a nation. That was a huge, you know, 2,000 year gap. But now what is next? Well, people are asking us all the time, what do you think is next, Pastor? Well, the next thing that's going to happen, according to God's word, 1 Thessalonians 4, I believe, is the rapture of the church. Uh, while there are numerous prophecies that need to be fulfilled before the second coming of Christ, which is seven years after that, there is no prophecy that needs to be fulfilled for the rapture to happen. It's imminent. It could occur at any moment. Interestingly, as we see the prophecies lining up for the second coming, uh, which include the regathering of Israel that has occurred, uh, the preparations for the rebuilding of the temple, as we see those things coming uh, into place for the second coming of Jesus, that must mean that the rapture that is seven years before could be that much quicker and more imminent. So the next thing that is going to happen is the rapture. I believe after that, the Bible teaches very clearly in Revelation that uh, there's going to be a peace agreement that uh, Antichrist, uh, the world leader, is going to uh, affect. It's a peace treaty with Israel. People will be astonished that he was able to broker peace in the Middle East. And of course, we know after the first three and a half years, he'll break that covenant with Israel, and we enter into the final three and a half years of Earth's history that result in Armageddon and ultimately the return of Christ. Uh, Pastor, what, what is the greatest weapon we have against being deceived? The sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Nothing cuts through the fog of deception any quicker than the Word of God. And I think when you look at Ephesians 6, I know you men have written on it about the 
um, the armament that God has provided for every Christian. You know, he talks about taking up the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, Hebrews 4, 12, the word of God is alive. It's active. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. Unfortunately, too many Christians are too unfamiliar with God's word. Uh, they have no idea uh, of its power or even of its content. And I think that's why you find so many Christians falling from the deceptions of the evil one. Mm. At the end of every chapter, we have spiritual insights and things that Christians can do to strengthen themselves against deception. What are some practical things? I know you mentioned the Word of God, which we also mention uh, or write extensively about throughout the book, but what practical things can Christians do to prepare for deception in these end times? You know, a couple of things I would suggest is, first of all, get in a Bible-believing church. Mm. I don't care what the label is, what the denomination is. It needs to be a church where the pastor preaches the whole counsel of God and believes that the Bible is the inerrant, infallible word of God. And those churches are getting harder and harder to find. But, uh, you know, when I hear a preacher and I want to see a preacher who opens his Bible and doesn't preach his opinion, but preaches the truth of God's word. Isaiah 48 says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. Secondly, I would just say to every believer, make sure you're getting a regular intake through the ear gate and the eye gate of God's word. And that takes some time. It takes some discipline. But frankly, my concern about many Christians is they're being manipulated by the media, the media on the left and the media on the right. And I tell my people, you know, if you're anxious all the time and upset and angry, watch less TV, look at fewer websites, listen to less talk radio. I can tell you from personal experience, it doesn't matter what network we're talking about. They have one goal, and that is to get as many eyeballs as they can watching, and they know how to do it. When they have their story meetings every morning, they say, what can we do to make our audience either anxious or angry? <laughs> that's what their goal is, because they know that's what attracts eyeballs and gets dollars. Don't be a victim of the media. Take mm. our cue. We should take our cue from God's word. Mm. Troy, if I may, a follow-on question. I see that you're going to lead an expedition of believers to Israel next year on your book of Revelation. Can you tell us a little bit about that, and why are you doing that? Well, we were planned. We planned to go last year, but had to shut down because of COVID. But uh, I tried to go every two years to Israel. We're going April 26th through May 6th. But I do it because I have found that when people actually visit Israel, it strengthens their faith. I mean, let's be honest. We read these stories and sometimes we get the idea that they took place in another world and we wonder if it really happened or not. When you go and see these are real locations where the Lord Jesus walked. When you stand on the Mount of Olives and realize this is the place he ascended into heaven and he's coming back again. When you stand in front of the empty tomb, as I know you do, and realize he really isn't there. He's risen from the dead. It does something to strengthen believers' faith in the reliability of Scripture. So that's why I go back year after year. Troy? You know, Pastor, you brought up a great point about the media. Uh, you know, I've, I've been a journalist working for mainstream publications for, you know, for three decades. And I've never seen a time like this where there's so much disinformation and propaganda, how the media is used. How, how do you believe the enemy is using the, the media and the messages we're being uh, delivered today uh, as we move into these uh, you know, potential end time events? Well, you know, I think, frankly, and I've written a new book called Invincible, and I talk about uh, one of the chapters moving from anxiety to peace. You know, anxiety has... Uh, uh, taking root in American thought right now. This pandemic has made people afraid. And, you know, sometimes the anxiety we feel is justified. Some of it uh, comes from unconfessed sin, the unrighteous tremble at the rustling of the leaves. Uh, uh, some of it uh, 
uh, comes from uh, other sources, uh, real things that we ought to be concerned about. But I really believe much of the anxiety we feel is the result of Satan's satanic attack. You know, I think uh, uh, in Ephesians 6, to go back that there, uh, Paul talks about taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish the flaming arrows of the evil one. You know, um, uh, in those days, soldiers would take an arrow and dip the tip of it in pitch and set it on fire and uh, send it toward the enemy. The only way to quench that flaming missile was to hold up a shield that was covered in weather-soaked uh, leather. Mm -hmm. And when that arrow would meet that water-drenched uh, shield, it would be extinguished immediately. I think Satan loves to send a lot of flaming missiles into our life, but I think his favorite is the one labeled worry or anxiety, because it has a way of just paralyzing us. I tell people, have you ever had that time where this worry came into your life? What if my spouse dies? What if my children rebel? What if I lose my job? And it just paralyzes us where we don't feel like reading our Bible. We don't feel like praying. We don't feel like doing anything. That's always a sign that that anxiety comes from Satan himself. So I would just be very careful about what you allow to go into your mind, what you meditate on, what you obsess over, because many times the media is the conduit through which these flaming arrows come into our life. Troy, uh, did, you, did you have any more questions before we end this conversation? This one is that. What, what principles in terms of combating deception can believers incorporate into their daily lives? <laughs> Here's the best practice I know. You know, uh, treasury agents have been charged with the responsibility of rooting out counterfeit currency in our culture. And uh, the way treasury agents are trained is not by looking at every variation of the dollar bill you can find so that they can recognize any counterfeit. That would take forever. Instead, what they do is they study the real dollar bill so uh, deeply and intricately. They are so filled with the knowledge of what a real dollar looks like, they are able to recognize counterfeit uh, immediately. And I think there's a principle there for Christians. Don't spend your time studying all the isms of the world and the false doctrines and, and so forth. Uh, instead, become immersed in the truth of God's word so deeply that you're able to recognize the counterfeit. And there's lots of it out there right away. Well, and that is a wonderful answer. Great. I think it's been a great conversation. I see our time is almost up. Is that what you're looking at too, Pastor? Is your time? Um... Yeah, I've got that show. It's two more minutes. And the only reason I'm going into another taping in just a little bit. But if there's something else I can answer for you, feel free to ask. In our last two minutes, Troy, do you have any burning questions for Pastor? Oh, no, no that's great. Just a, a great honor. Thank you so much, uh, Pastor. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you so much for taking your time and uh, we'll continue to pray for you and your ministry. Thank you. Appreciate what you all are doing as well. God bless. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Battle Ready Ministries is a life changing, prophecy based ministry for churches, Christians, and all those who love God. Time grows short. It's time to get the church ready for battle. We are a group of believers in Jesus Christ who believe that it is time to prepare the church for the end times return of the Lord by being ready to battle the forces of darkness in our lost world. We do this by using battle-tested strategies to prepare believers' lives and souls for the end times, training warriors of God to engage the enemy. Our group consists of seasoned war veterans, Bible scholars, pastors, authors, thought leaders on spiritual preparations for the end times, and strong warriors of God. All of us are fully committed to equipping the church in the end times to be warriors in the supernatural strength of the Lord. Our focus is not just on imparting wisdom and knowledge about spiritual warfare and prophetic themes, but what we must do to prepare believers to take appropriate action in response to the enemy's all-out assault on the church and the world. Invite our team to speak at your churches, conferences, retreats, camps, and other venues. We are ready to travel anywhere to educate and train pastors, churches, believers, and all who have an interest in joining the army of God and being ready for the coming of our Lord. 
Be sure to subscribe to the free newsletter as well as subscribe to the Battle Ready Ministries YouTube channel so you won't miss any of our videos. Like, comment, and share this message. Help us to spread the word. Tell a friend. Tell your friends. Tell your pastors, your church friends, and your congregation. Battle Ready Ministries Mission and Vision to raise up warriors of God in the end times, prepare the saints for the days ahead, and to be a training resource for equipping churches and Christian families in the last days.